looking for the Lord to uh, come and get the children of God. Amen. Those that have made a um, covenant with him through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are soon awaiting his arrival. Can the church say amen? I was debating as to what to teach tonight. Uh, and I think the Lord settled my mind on going back to the subject that we uh, were dealing with. Um, last week, Wednesday, we had finished up, if memory serves me correct, on we had finished up the um, work of the Levite, and we were dealing with the, uh, the ten-toe kingdom of the Antichrist. And so we're going to give you tonight a little bit more detail um, in the scriptures on that particular subject. And whether we uh, know it or not, we are in the day of the, those ten kingdoms that are spoken um, in the second chapter of the book of Daniel and also in the seventh chapter and in the book of Revelation. We are living in that generation or that time where those kingdoms exist today. And as we may mention last week, saints, and I do believe that the breaking up of the uh, EU is a fulfillment of uh, prophecy. And, and uh, this is what has to happen in as much as God has said it in his word that uh, the time would have to be right, as it were, for him and uh, for when Jesus to come back, as it were, for his church. These things have to be going on. And so we uh, begin to deal a little bit with that, and I was not able to give you all the details and all the uh, ins and outs as to what um, this image depicted, and also the nations, some of the nations that will be um, influential in the end times. Scriptures do speak of this. So let's go back now uh, to the um, second chapter of the book of Daniel as a place to start uh, and we're going to try to give a little bit more detail on the subject can the church say amen and if the Lord will we'll get you back into the book of Revelation and show you the fall of this particular kingdom the fall of the kingdom the ten toe kingdom that Daniel is seeing second chapter and we are interested, let's see, let me get here, I got my old Bible out tonight, got a little bit more notes in this particular Bible uh, than, I had in, than I have in my new Bible. Praise the Lord. So look at Daniel, it's going to take me a little bit more time to get to it because it's a little bit tattered. Right. It's been worn out as they say. Right. So now let's look at this image that, that, um, Daniel was seen. Now, this is a dream that Daniel, or excuse me, a vision, excuse me, that Daniel is given, and it's an interpretation of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, um, as it were, had. There was no, none of the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, as it were, of the kingdom of Babylon could tell the dream. Um, to, as it were, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, what happened in history was that after the dream came to Nebuchadnezzar, he could not recall it. And so, when he came to all of his wise men, he asked of them to give them not only what the dream was, but the interpretation thereof. And so, in um, the king's haste, he made a decree, as it were, to kill all the wise men of Babylon. But there was yet one wise man, which was Daniel. And Daniel, um, as it were, made the point that why, king, are thou so hasty, as it were, to do this? And he made the point that secrets belong unto God. And the scripture said in Daniel, I mean not in Daniel, but Deuteronomy chapter 29 and 29, the secret things belong unto our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us. So Daniel um, went into, as it were, prayer. And God revealed unto him not only the dream, 
but the interpretation thereof. Can the church say amen? amen? And so this is what you're reading here in the second chapter of the book of Daniel. You're reading the, uh, not only the dream, but the interpretation thereof that God gives to Daniel. And as I said last week, these kingdoms that you're seeing, uh, this image, as it were, excuse me, that you're seeing is kingdoms. And Daniel was seeing kingdoms rising and falling. Now, I want to make a point to you. In the ninth chapter of this particular book, Daniel asked God what was going to happen to his people. And so what God did for Daniel in, this partic- in the book of Daniel is that God answered his question specifically. And so what God gave Daniel was kingdoms that would affect the children of Israel. In that day and in this day, when we get over to the seventh chapter, I'm going to give you a little bit more detail to show you that the kingdoms, that, uh, that, the, that the image of the beast that God gave Daniel the interpretation of in that and those, those beasts pertain to kingdoms that exist in that day and kingdoms that exist in this day that affect Israel. Can the church say amen? amen? And somebody may ask, well, pastor, why are you teaching us this? I'm teaching us this because we're getting close to the time when the man of sin is going to be revealed. And he is going to come and take over what is known as the Tento kingdom of the Antichrist. The iron, the feet of iron mixed with clay. He's going to take over that particular kingdom. And he is more, and that kingdom, saints, is more dreadful than any other kingdom that has ever existed. Can the church say amen? amen. And so let's, now let's go back. And we're going to read this again. We're going to read a little bit more, actually, because from verses numbers 31 down to, through 35, you see this image. You see it rising and falling. You see, as it were, the stone coming. And you see the millennial reign of Christ being set up. But then he's going to give you a little more detail from verses numbers 36 and beyond. Can the church say amen? That part we did not read last week. So let's read here verses numbers 31. Thou, O king, sawest and beholdest a great image, this, uh, this great image, which, uh, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, mm-hmm, and the form thereof was terrible. Mm-hmm. Read. This image was a head of fine gold and his chest was of iron of silver and his, and his belly was of belly and thighs were brass. His legs and his, and his feet and his, uh, and his feet was of iron and part clay. Read. And thou Thou sawest till the stone. Now that stone is who? That stone is Jesus Christ. Read. Was, was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay. So this image that is standing, these are kingdoms. This image is standing, and this is what Daniel was seeing. And then he sees a stone that is hewed out of the mountain without hands. Now that is the rock of ages. That is the stone which the builders discarded that became the head of the corner. And the head of the corner of our church is who? Jesus Christ. Now, what, and what the Bible makes it very, very clear to us, saints, is that Israel was supposed to be builders in the building. But they disallowed the stone. The Bible said in one place that inasmuch as the bricks have fallen, that's a prophecy dealing with Israel, that's in the book of Isaiah, the bricks fell, and then he was going to build with hewn stones. The hewn stones are lively stones that Peter talked about in the building. That's what he's building with today, you and I, the souls of men. But this particular stone is going to come and cut down the, the image, the image that he's seeing is the kingdoms of man. And the devil saints has ruled in every kingdom of man from Egypt unto the beast, um, as it were, kingdom that will come during the tribulation period. Can the church say amen? All right, let's keep reading here. Mm-hmm. 
Then was the iron and clay and brass and silver and gold broken to pieces together. Now it's all coming down together. Read. And became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor and the wind carried them away. Now we're going to see this in the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation when we get here. And in the 19th chapter, when he takes down the false church system, and when, he take, when the Lord takes down and comes in the battle of Armageddon and makes an end of man's government and then sets up his own government, where there'll be peace on earth and goodwill toward men. And so what you're seeing over here in the European, uh, European countries, you're seeing the formulation of, this, of the feet of this image coming together. The EU is breaking up, and I made a point to you last week that it will be saints out of, as it were, out of Italy that the Antichrist will come. Out of Rome, Italy. He will be a Roman by citizenship and a Jew by nationality. Did you guys know that? The Bible said he would not regard the uh, God of his fathers, and the Jews will not except anybody that is a non-Jew to be their Messiah. So he has to be a Jew. Praise the Lord. And he's going to make a covenant with them for how many weeks? One week. Daniel saw all of this in the book of Daniel. And in the midst of that week, he's going to break that covenant. This is what he's going to do. But in this particular image, he's seeing these kingdoms. And this is, this is something to, be, to behold. Here is Nebuchadnezzar, a wicked king. But the Bible called Nebuchadnezzar in one place God's servant. Why was he God's servant? Because God used those kings of that day to chastise Israel. So what you're seeing right here is when, when Israel went into captivity, it started with Bishop, I mean Bishop Combs is going to teach next week, the times of the Gentiles. It was the time in which God put Israel under total Gentile rule, where they were never an independent nation. Now, people say that Israel is independent right now. Well, they're really not. They're still being chastised. They're still being bombarded by Gentile nations. And that will not uh, be released off of them into the middle of the tribulation period. And the reason why I'm bringing this uh, Bible class to us is because... Many people in America is, are, are so involved in their own lives and what, what, what American politics and what we are, what we got going on over here. What is happening to America is not the, the, the most important thing on the stage of God. Amen. Anybody know where the navel of the earth is? The navel or the beginning, of, uh, the, the beginning of man over there in the Middle East. It's going to, it started in the Middle East. And it will end there. Can the church say amen? amen? All right. Read here. All right. Let me see here. The summer threshing floor. Mm-hmm. And the wind carried them away. Mm-hmm. And there was no place found for them. Mm-hmm. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain. This great mountain is the millennial reign of Christ. Mountains in your Bible is symbolic of governments. In his, this will be where he sets up his government when he comes in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation and he cuts down the image. He's going to cut down that ten-toe kingdom, the Antichrist, that will revive out of the Roman Empire. The deadly wound was healed. That is the reviving of the Roman Empire. And I'm going to show you that in the scripture. All right, let's keep reading here. Mm -hmm. This is the dream. And we will uh, tell the interpretation there of now the he, now he shows him the dream, right? Now you're going to see the interpretation thereof. And remember, secret things belong unto our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us. This is revealed to us based upon the imagery that God has given us in the scripture. Because the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel is synonymous books from this regard. What happens in the book of Revelation, many of those things affect the children of Israel. And everything that affected the children of Israel, God gave to John in a vision in the same similitude that he gave to Daniel. Sometimes different verbiage 
but the same thing. Can the church say amen? All right. This is, okay, this is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. He says, hear, O king. Now, who's king? now, who is he talking to? He's talking to the head of gold now. This is, the, this is who he's talking to. He's talking to the head of gold. Now, you will notice when you read this, saints, that as they start from the head of gold and go down, all the material becomes inferior. The kingdoms of man have become less inferior as time went on. Because a, less, a lesser, uh, an inferior kingdom came in and took over Babylon. And I'm going to show you that 175 years before Babylon fall, fell, saints, Isaiah prophesied of the king that would take over Babylon. Can the church say amen? It's all in your Bible. All right, let's read here. Mm-hmm. He says, now, O king, our king of kings, or he's, this is the kingdom of kingdoms. Can the church say amen? The greatest kingdom here. King of what? Kings. The head of gold. Okay, read. For the God of heaven has given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory. Mm-hmm. He says, and, where, uh, and wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beast of the field and the fowl of the, of the heavens has been given unto thine hands, mm-hmm. and have made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head, what, of gold. Read, now, I want you to see this here, read. And after, and after uh, thee shall arise another kingdom inferior, mm-hmm. And another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over the earth. Now, let me show you that inferior kingdom. Let's go now. I told you I was going to give it to you. Let's go now to Isaiah. This is the kingdom that came in and took over Babylon. Now, this is history in your Bible. Isaiah chapter number, uh, let's see here, 45. I don't know how far I'm going to get tonight, saints. I don't know what Bishop Combs is going to actually deal with. He may deal with some of these same scriptures. So I'm not going to try to walk over what he's going to teach. But um, seeing that we're in here, we might as well deal with it. Can the church say amen? Now, what you're seeing right now, saints, is the formulation of the, of the feet. Praise the Lord. And we're starting from the head of the image, and we're going to work our way down. 45, did I say 45? 45, let me see here, I went over it. All right, 45. This is 175 years prior to the invasion of the medial Persian Empire, to the invasion where the Bible said that they fell in one night. You remember where um, after they took the vessels, of the temple, and then um, I think it was Belteshazzar, he had a feast. And the Bible said that, as it were, the um, God's hand came and wrote on the wall, Tecto, Teco, you farkin, I can't remember exactly how it was. This day ye have been found as it were wanting. And they fell that night, if memory serves me correct. But 175 years prior, this prophecy came forth. Read here. Thus saith the Lord, to his, what, his anointed, to Cyprus, whose right hand I have, up, what, I have, up, uh, I have holden, mm -hmm. so, uh, what, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings, mm -hmm, and open before him the two levy gates. Now, that is important in history, because history tells us that the, that the city of Babylon was the most fortified kingdom that ever existed. If you guys research this. And what happened was that, the, what happened was that the, they, in that kingdom, when they fell that night, they had the gates open. This prophecy was fulfilled. Praise the Lord. There would, would have been no way for them to be able, a, a, a kingdom less inferior 
to come in and break down the walls, tear down the city of Babylon unless they had a way in. So the levy gates, because what happened was there was as it, um, in that day, the uh, king Cyprus diverted the Euphrates River and made it a lake so that he can cross over it. And when this happened, this prophecy was fulfilled. The levy gates were down. The gates were open, and then a less inferior kingdom was able to go in and destroy Babylon. And then that entered in the medial Persian Empire, as Daniel saw in the image. Can the church say amen? A, a less inferior kingdom came in and took over Babylon. Now who's seeing this? This is Isaiah seeing it. Isaiah was a prophet of the northern kingdom. But he speaks of that which is going to happen under the inspiration of God before it actually happened. Read. And I will go before thee and make, make what? Crooked place. Uh, straight. Mm -hmm. And I will break in pieces. Gates of brass. And cut asunder. The bar of the vine. Read. And I will give thee the treasure of darkness. And the hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that what I am who? The Lord, whom, uh, who called thee by what name? What name did he call him by? Cyprus. And it was King Cyprus that gave the decree for the children of Israel to go back out of Babylon, as it were, or the Media Persian Empire, and rebuild the temple. Did you guys know that? It was King Cyprus who gave the decree to allow them to go. After the prophecy of, I think it was, Jeremiah was fulfilled of the 70 years of captivity that they were in. Because remember, Daniel lived through the whole captivity. Daniel was approximately, I think, 92 years old when he died. He lived from the beginning to the end. He was a young man when he went in, and he lived all the, he lived all the way through. But I'm showing you in the Bible and you can also research in history, this is how it was. Now, I'm going to give you some facts here. Let me show you how the magnitude of this city that fell. The city saints, the walls were 60 miles around, 15 miles on each side, and 300 miles high. So when, when God told Daniel a less inferior kingdom was going to take over Babylon, they had to have some help. And know who did it? God did. He went before them. And the Bible makes it very clear. If you go back up to verses numbers 28 of the 44th chapter, the scripture said, thus says of Cyprus, he is what? My shepherd. The evil king. Simply to make the point that God used these men to work on Israel. Can the church say amen? And so that image, that image that we saw is the image of kingdoms rising and falling, coming into power, leaving power. Now, four of those kingdoms have fallen. One is yet to come. We are in the time of that last kingdom. Can the church say amen? Now, before that kingdom comes, the rapture of the church has to take place. But we are in those days. And like I told you last week, why people are so involved with what we're doing over here in the western part of the world. God is dealing with what is happening in Israel, getting and dealing with them and preparing us spiritually. But what God has said was going to happen to Israel is going to happen, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. Can the church say amen? This was a less inferior kingdom coming in through those gates. And history tells us when, when they diverted that river, the Euphrates River. Now, I wanna, I'm going to tell you something about Euphrates River as we continue on with this Bible class because there's a lot of things that in Bible prophecy that happen around that river. Can the church say amen? Praise the Lord. Amen. A lot of things that happen that we'll deal with. So this inferior kingdom came in. They diverted the, uh, the river of Euphrates. They crossed over the river and caught them off guard with the gates down. And they entered into the city while they were having a feast and took the city in that night. Can the church say amen? Now you see the prophecy. Now let's go back to the book of Daniel. Let's go back to the second chapter. I'm 
trying to move as fast as I can tonight. Can the church say amen? All right, verse 39. And after uh, this shall arrive the inferior kingdom. This is the medial Persian Empire. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the third uh, kingdom of brass. Mm-hmm. Shall bear rule over the earth. Mm-hmm. Now let's look. Then there was a, then the third, then the fourth kingdom was the Grecian Empire. Can the church say amen? The Grecian Empire came in. If memory serves me correct. Yes. The third, the third kingdom, excuse me. The third kingdom of this image is the Grecian Empire, which is represented as Alexander the Great. He took over the Medes and Persian. Then we're going to get down to the fourth one. Read here, verses number 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, as iron that breaketh all, the, all these shall break in pieces and bruise. Now this speaks, saints, of the legs of iron. The legs of iron was the longest kingdom of man, which was the Roman Empire, which was in power, saints, for 1,229 years. And so this was the most unhumane kingdom that ever existed toward Israel. They stumped out, they bruised, they destroyed. This is what Daniel is seeing. He's seeing these legs coming in and breaking everything asunder. It, it is, in, it is uh, referred to as two legs because there was two divisions, as it were, of the Roman Empire. Can the church say amen? Now he's giving them the interpretation. Now we know what these kingdoms are now because we have the benefit of looking back into, looking back from history as to see what they are. And if you believe you me, there has never been a kingdom that was more inhumane to Israel than the Roman Empire. But the Roman Empire disintegrated and became a uh, how can I say a religious and religio-political empire when they brought in the Catholic Church. It became religio-political. And this was the disintegration of that empire. Can the church say amen? And you're going to see who the head of the, uh, of the uh, false church system is when we get to it in the book of Revelation, which is the Catholic Church. She is referred to as the mother of harlots in your Bible. All right, let's keep reading here. All right. Broken pieces, bruised. Read, whereas thou seest what the feet and toes apart, what clay and part of iron, mm -hmm, and the kingdom shall be divided, and there, sh and there shall be in it the strength of iron. See, the strength of iron has to do with the influence of the Roman Empire. That's what this deals with. The last kingdom will have the influence of the Roman Empire. And let me give you this. Our political system, our governmental system is set up like Rome, whether you know it or not. Did you guys know that? Now, somebody asked the question, well, pastor, well, where is the United States going to be in end time prophecy? Well, I'll tell you this. In that day, there'll be ten toes, which is the ten toe European kingdoms that are there right now. Out of that kingdom, out of those kingdoms, will the Antichrist arise. He will come out of Rome, Italy. But in the last days, the, the kingdoms of the world will be, as it were, uh, broken up into three divisions. The kings of the north, the kings of the south, and the beasts. So who do you think America is going to be aligned with? The beast. We will be in there. But we will be aligned with somebody, say, the beast in that day. You won't be, but America will be. So when people are hollering about home of the free of the brave and all these type of things, everything is going to be under the rule of the Antichrist. Every single body. Can the church say amen? So the westernized society, our society, will align themselves. Because our government is set up just like Rome. And who is, the, who is an ally of Israel? America is. I'm going to show you that in a minute also. 
Because when he gave him another image in the seventh chapter, he showed us even more detail of how this is going to take place. So somebody keep, keep waving your flag if you want to. And that's all right. But let's wave the flag of Jesus. Hallelujah. Because that is the banner that matters. Because at the end of the day, everybody's going to be, a, every kingdom that exists right now will be a part of this Tinto kingdom in which the Antichrist will rise out of, out of. He will subdue three kings. There'll be seven left. We will be aligned with the beast. Can the church say amen? Read here. Mm -hmm. And as the toes of the feet were part iron, mm -hmm. are you with me? And are part clay, so the kingdoms shall be, uh, shall be part strong and part weak. So it will be right because every single kingdom has what? Become weaker. So it will get weaker and weaker as these particular kingdoms come on the scene. Read here. Verses numbers um, 40, 43. Whereas thou seest iron uh, mixed with uh, miry clay, they shall mingle together mm -hmm, with the seed of men. Mm -hmm. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is mixed with clay. Read. And in the days of those kings, mm -hmm, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Set up a kingdom. Now, what you're seeing here, saints, is you're seeing him now begin to formulate, as it were, the millennial reign of Christ. Let's keep reading here. Which thou, what shall never... Be destroyed because when he comes, the Bible said of the increase of his kingdom. Let's go to uh, Isaiah chapter number nine. Let me give you that scripture. We quote, we quote chapter, we quote verses six, but we don't quote seven. Because the Bible said of the increase of his kingdom, there shall be no end. So once this image falls, the next thing that's going to happen is God in Christ is going to set up his kingdom here on earth. Where the scripture will be fulfilled in Luke where he said there'll be peace on earth and goodwill toward men. There is no peace now. There's turmoil now. We have peace because he's in our hearts. But the world is in a upheaval, in insurrection. There's violence everywhere, saints. And you know what we need to be doing? Looking up for our redemption draws nigh. So let me show you this here in your Bible so you can understand. Chapter 9 of Isaiah, verses number 7. Are we there? Y'all waiting on me, right? The pastor needs to speed it up. Praise the Lord. Okay, let's read here. And of the increase of his government. Now that government was the mountain we just spoke of. Now when he sets up his government, read here. Uh-huh. In peace shall be no end. Did not Daniel speak in those terms? When this takes place, there will not be a kingdom that can overthrow it. Because when he comes and he fights the battle of Armageddon, saints, he's going to hit that kingdom of the Antichrist and destroy this image. Now, let me, make it to, let me give it to you like this. This image simply reflects the spirit of the devil, of the spirit that is influencing the world. So don't think he's coming to destroy Babylon. Babylon always failed. That image represents the spirit of Antichrist because the devil has been in each and every one of the kingdoms of man. So when Jesus comes and the sword issues out of his mouth, and the, in another place Daniel said it will be like fire that will issue out, he's going to destroy the, the system of man. And this scripture will be fulfilled. Let's read. Upon the throne of David, did we not we teach a Bible class dealing with the five, the five works of the sonship? One of the works of the sonship is, is to establish the throne of David because as we've already talked about, David will be king on this earth. But Jesus will establish his throne during the 1,000 year millennial reign of Christ where he will come and sit down physically on the throne and rule in Jerusalem for how many years? A thousand years. Then he will turn that kingdom over to who? David. And that will be David's inheritance. Because he already promised David that of his, of his kingdom, there shall be no end, as it were. Can the church say amen? Or that there will ne never be a time where one will not cease to sit on his throne. See, David was the greatest king that Israel ever had. 
He was the king that actually united the kingdom. He was the preparer. Can the church say amen? All right, let's keep reading here. All right. And establish it with what? Mm -hmm. he, uh, let's get and order it and establish it with, judge, with judgment and with justice from henceforth forever. The zeal of the Lord has spoken it. Um, the zeal of the Lord uh, of hosts will, excuse me, perform it. So he's going to do it. Now Daniel is seeing this in prophecy. And then he is now giving the interpretation to Nebuchadnezzar as to what all of this means. Can the church say amen? So this here we read in verse number 44. Let's go back. Verses number 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom mm -hmm, which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other, peop uh, to other people but it, what? it shall break in pieces and consume all the kingdoms. Mm-hmm. And it shall what? Stand forever. Verses numbers. Um, let me see here. I, no, let's go down to verse number 45. Let's read. read. For as much as thou seest, the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands mm -hmm, and break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold. Mm -hmm. The great God has shown what? To the king, what shall come to pass hereafter, read. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. Why is it sure? Because secret things, saints, belong unto our God. Praise the Lord, and to he reveals them. And he revealed it to who, Daniel? And Daniel gave it to who? Nebuchadnezzar. Now let's go to the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel. Can the church say amen? Let's fast forward here. This is the last king of, king of Babylon. Because after this king, the kingdom fell. Now remember this. No prophecy, saints, is in direct order. So when you, this as you read the book of Daniel, and the book of Daniel is not in order. See, this happens, but in chapters number 6 and 5, you see events that happen later. Because no prophecy is in direct order. Can the church say amen? So Bel, uh, Belshazzar was the last king of Babylon. But it is in chapter 7. But if you deal, if you look in an order, it's maybe out of order to us, but it's in order to God. Because God did this specifically to cause men to be tripped up. So he couldn't read the Bible like it's a novel and get an understanding. Because that's not the way God designed the scriptures. Can the church say amen? So let's see what uh, God reveals to Daniel in the, um, under King Belteshazzar's reign. There was eight kings that lived in that day under Daniel. This was the last king. All right, read. In the first year of Belteshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and vision. Now, what is a dream? A dream happens when you're asleep. A vision happens when you are awake. Read, and of this, and of his head, mm -hmm. read, and of his head upon his bed, and when he wrote the dream, he told the sum of the matter. And Daniel spoke and said, "I saw in a vision by night, and behold, the four uh, winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, mm -hmm. and four great beasts." So this sea here geographically is as I talked about. Last week is the Mediterranean Sea. In prophecy, it is the um, people. He's seeing these kingdoms rising. Same situation as we talked about in the book of Revelation. Because remember, the, the, sea of Medi the, the Mediterranean Sea was also called the Great Sea. And all of those kingdoms that he's seeing geographically are coming out of that area. Under, they're all going to be under the beast at that time. You guys understand that? So this great sea in prophecy is him seeing it coming out of, he's seeing kingdoms rising out of the people. Can the church say amen? Read great sea and read here. Four great beasts came 
from the sea or out of the people, diverse one from another. Now he's going to make a point here. Read. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And I beheld till the wings thereof was plucked and it was lifted up from the earth mm -hmm, and made to stand as a man. Mm -hmm, and a man's heart was given to it. Now, when I started the Bible class, I told you that Daniel was seeing kingdoms that affect Israel, right? In this vision, he's seeing, a, this, this vision, he's seeing kingdoms that affect Israel in that day and also in our day. This image, this beast here is depicted what? As a, let's read again, as a lion. The lion is the king of beasts. It is, the, it is the king of all beasts. The greatest kingdom that existed in that day was what? Babylon. What is the great, greatest kingdom that exists today? America. The eagle is the king of all fowl. You understand that? The heart in this, the heart in this image reflects the heart of a man or humanity. This is all symbolic language. Because the kingdom of Babylon, even though it was dreadful, it was the most humane kingdom to Israel, was the kingdom of Babylon. So he's seeing Babylon here, the kingdom that is in power right now. But he's also, in our day, this represents the kingdom that is the most humane to Israel, which has a heart of a man. We are humanitarians all around the world. Now, think about it like this. Every time there's a world conflict, who wants to come to the rescue? United States. United States. Who has been coming to Israel's rescue? The United States. We are, their, we are their greatest allies. So this heart is symbolic of humanitarianism. And the beast that you see here is the king of all beasts, the king of fowl, which is the eagle. The, mo the greatest fowl of the air is what? The eagle. Whose insignia is the eagle? America. America. Praise the Lord. Now you understand what, what, what we're talking about here? This is symbolic language that deals with kingdoms that affect Israel at that day and kingdoms that, that will affect Israel in the end times. This is what this deals with. Yes, ma'am. Well, some have interpreted that the, the wings were plucked off. Right? That's what you're getting at? Had eagle's wings. Yes. What, what this, what the heart of, the, what, remember, the eagle is symbolic of um, the, the greatest beast, the, the greatest beast of the air. So I'm trying to show us that this, that what Daniel is seeing is, is, is kingdoms that affect Israel in that day and Israel in this day. So the eagle's wings is symbolic language, but uh, most definitely the heart of a man is, how can I say, it is symbolic of humanity, of, of humanitarianism, which we, the United States, are the most humane kingdom or the humane um, individuals to Israel. See, what we have to understand is this vision that Daniel is seeing is dealing with the end times and in his day. This is the reason why this, the, he's using the images of this beast, of these particular beasts. Now, when we get down to the Ten Toe Kingdom, there's no beast in the uh, kingdom of beasts or the kingdom that God made that depicts how dreadful and evil the beast that uh, the kingdom of the devil will be in that day. I hope I'm making sense, but remember this. I'll, I'll tell you this. Some of this we have to understand by what we see in our day. Now, to say that there's a scripture that says that the eagle is America, America's not in your Bible. America's not in your Bible. But we see similitudes as we get closer to the fulfillment of the prophecy that is given as to what these things mean or who is the players in the end time 
And so the similitude that we see here is that the greatest kingdom at that day was Babylon. And the greatest kingdom that exists when the devil will come will be America. And we have a, the heart of a man is symbolic of humanitarianism. It's symbolic of having the, the desire to help. And that is America. Because this deals with Israel. This doesn't deal with us. Because we're, this, this deal with this. We're doing, cut the tape off. Go ahead. At that day, at that day, elder, it represented Babylon. The head of gold represented Babylon. Well, there's no, but see, there's no scripture to, there's no scripture to support that. Because some have taught that the wings plucked off is, is dealing with when we came out of Great Britain. But there's not a scripture to say that. We can only understand, we can only look at it from what kingdoms will be in power when this takes place. And what it means in that day as opposed to what we see today. Because Great Britain is a part of what? The EU. Isn't that right? Great Britain is, not anymore, they're, see, they're, breaking, they're breaking apart as we speak. So Great Britain, the geographic area of Great Britain is over there by the Mediterranean Sea. You understand? So those will, that will be, no doubt, the kings of the north. And you're going to see, let's keep reading here. I hope I'm making sense because I cannot tell you exactly, but I can only tell you as what we see based upon what the scriptures tell us. Am I going to tell you that, that Greece will be here, that Rome, that, that, um, that uh, the Netherlands will be here? There's no scripture to say that. But we see the similitude and the powers that exist today as we get closer to what these, Im what these images mean. You get the point? All right, now let's keep reading here. All right, and then the look at the second beast. Read, and behold, another beast, second like a bear, mm -hmm. and it rolls up itself on one side, and it had three ribs mm -hmm. in its mouth, and it was between its teeth, and there said, uh, it said, and they said, thus, uh, they, they said, thus unto it, arise and devour much flesh. Now, in that day, it represented the Medio Persian Empire that came in, and history tells us. That they devoured three kings. The three rib, the three kings is the Babylonian Empire. You guys may not know this. It was the Bab one of them was the Babylonian Empire. And then it was the, Egy the Egyptian as they were coming. History, you, you can research all this. I can't give it to you all in one night. They came in and devoured. Now, now, the, now the bear saints is very slow. But it wreaks much havoc. And so this is symbolic language in that day that dealt with the rise of the medio persian Empire that came in as they were conquesting. They conquested three kings to take over the Babylonian Empire. And in our day, it represents the red bear. Because in, the, in prophecy, they, the kings are going to come from the north. What is in the north? Russia. They're going to come down to try to take a spoil. God is going to put a hook in what? Their jaw. Can the church say amen? So it represented kingdoms that affect Israel in that day and in this day. So in that day, it was the medio Persian Empire coming and wreaking havoc. Now, history would tell us this, that they were not, a, as it were, a, a fast, it, they, they were, um, how can I say it? They came and devoured. And these three, these three ribs depicts that, all right, in his mouth. And let's look at the fourth beast. Read. And after this I beheld, mm -hmm, and lo, mm -hmm, like a what leopard, which had upon his, uh, his back, and of it uh, four wings of a fowl. The beast mm -hmm, also had four heads. And dominion was given it. Now this is uh, representatory of that day 
remember these are kings that deal with Israel, of the Grecian Empire. Praise the Lord. The Grecian Empire was headed by Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great conquered more than any other king in a short amount of time. He was 19 when he conquered the then known world. He was 19. He came in swiftly and devoured. Now a leopard by nature is fast and bloodthirsty. He shed more blood as he conquered than any other king. This also represents nations in our day. You know what nation it represents in our day? Iran. Who's cutting people's heads off? ISIS. Can the church say amen? These are kingdoms, as I repeat, that affect who? Israel in that day and in this day. Can the church say amen? I hope I'm, hope I'm, not, I hope I'm making sense today. If I'm, if, I'm, if I'm not, I'll certainly try to do the best that I can for us to understand. All right? So this is what these empires represent. Now let's look at the fourth. Now this, the fourth one was more dreadful. The fourth image that he's seeing here, saints, is the Tinto kingdom that, that will arise in the end times. Read. And after this I saw a night vision, and behold, the fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, mm -hmm, and it had great iron teeth. Now the iron teeth is representative of what? Rome. Because Rome is Rome was the most, how can I say it, dreadful of all the kingdoms. Iron had legs of iron. It stamped out. So these iron teeth rep represents the Roman influence because it will be the re reviving saints of the Roman Empire that will, that will take over. That is the last kingdom of man. The seventh and last kingdom or the ten-toe kingdom that will come on the scene and it will devour. Now you notice here, in every other kingdom, he gives a description of an animal to refer to the behavior of that kingdom. Getting back to the red bear. The red bear devoured. What is it trying to do right now, saints, over in the Ukraine? Devour. The red bear is, has the largest landmass, and it is slow, it's cumbersome, but it has great power. It destroys anything in its past. But this particular kingdom is so evil and it's so diabolical and so debaucherous, saints, that there is no animal in the kingdom of man that God could use to describe how dreadful it will be. Wow. Can the church say amen? All right. Let's keep going here. It had great teeth and it devoured, read in broken pieces, and stamped mm -hmm, the residue. Now this is exactly what the legs of iron did. It broke in pieces. It stamped. It destroyed. Read. With the feet thereof. Mm -hmm. And what? It was, it was diverse from all the beasts, or all the kingdoms mm -hmm, that, went, uh, that were before it. And what it had, ten horns. This ten horns is the ten-toe kingdom that will arise in the last days. And this is what you're seeing in prophecy. Let's keep reading here. And beside the horns, read, behold. There came up among them, what, a little horn. This is the Antichrist, read. Before whom these were, there were three, what, of the first horns plucked up. That is where when Daniel said he saw seven, he saw seven crowns. Because when the Antichrist comes up, he's going to subdue three kings. Because he's coming, saints, in the power of, first of all, Persuasion, cunning, craftiness, war, and destruction. He's not coming to make peace. He's a man of war, as the Bible said. Can the church say amen? And while people are shaking hands and making, having fun and think, think, thinking stuff is funny, the enemy is, this is going to take place. Now, this kingdom is going to be the most dreadfulest of all and is going to persecute, as we told you last week, the woman. The woman was Israel. God's going to protect her. Can the church say amen? Praise the Lord. Read. Mm -hmm. Little horn before whom there were three uh, of the first horns plucked up by the root. Mm -hmm. And behold, in his what? Horns were eyes like eyes of a man. 
and a mouth speaking great things. He was as a man because he is the man. He's a man of sin. But here the Bible talked about he's going to have a mouth speaking things. Now, don't think it would this be the devil by himself in the person of Antichrist doing all of this. Me in, um, yes, in the person of Antichrist doing all of this. He will also have a false prophet or beast ministry that will speak wonders and show signs. And I'm going to show you that of the Lord will tonight, that God is going to bring them down. Just like he's, when he brings down this um, Tinto kingdom. All right, let's keep reading here. And I beheld till the thrones were cast down. Those thrones is the Tinto kingdom being cast down. Same language as we saw in, in, chapter, in chapter number two. Now it's being cast down. The, the, foot of the, the feet of the image is being struck in by Jesus. Read. And the ancient of days, or who's the ancient of days? Who's be, who is the only one that is without beginning of days, end of life? God. So the God in the person of Jesus Christ is now going to come read. Mm-hmm. Whose garment was white as snow. And his hair of his head was like pure wool. Now who saw this? Who saw this same similitude? John in the first chapter of the book of Revelation. John saw him in his priestly array with paps. Saw him coming as a high priest in the image of a high priest. Here he's coming, saints, as a lion of the tribe of Judah. He's not coming to make peace now. This is God in Christ coming to cut down man's government. Cut down these four beasts. Cut down the, t- cut down the image that Nebuchadnezzar seen. Can the church say amen? Because every single kingdom of man, every single one of them, saints, has had some, how can I say it, the spirit of Antichrist working in it from all the way from Egypt down to the day in which we are in right now. Can the church say amen? All right, read. Mm-hmm, the snow, okay. And his throne was like at the fury of what fire and his will as burning what fire. Because what's going to issue out of his mouth? Somebody say a sword. It's going to, he's going to send judgment like a fire. You know what's coming with him? The church, the glorified church. Let's keep reading here, all right? Mm, and a furious stream issue and came forth from before him a thousand and a thousand ministering. Now, I don't have time to show you all this, but you just have to take my word because I'm telling you the truth. The thousand thousands are the angels. One writer said it, I saw the Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints, that's the, that's the church, but he, with a thousand thousands, that's in Jude chapter, uh, verse number 14. So this is the angels coming, and then the church coming with them. Let's keep reading here. And ten thousand, time ten thousand, stood before him. That's the glorified church. John saw that in the fifth chapter of the book of Revelation. The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. That's in Jude. Then another place in the book of Revelation. And I may have to take you that because I don't want to get you confused. I may have to take you there in a minute to prove that to you, okay? Read. And what are they going to do? They're going to set, they come with, uh, with set judgment. And what was open? What the books were open, read. And I beheld then before the voice of a great, great words, read. Which the horn uh, spake. And I beheld till the beast was slain. And his body destroyed, and it was given to the burning flame. So what is it? Let, let me go there now since I've I'm, I'm got you confused. I can sense already. So let's go now to the book of Revelation. Let's go now. Let me show you what I'm talking about, what this scripture is dealing with. Revelation chapter 19. Because I'm making statements, but I'm not giving you all the scriptures to show you. 19. Church, amen. What you're seeing here, two things in this chapter. The supper of the Lamb, which will take place at the end of the tribulation period after all four groups have called up, and then he's going to come and issue judgment or the battle of Armageddon. Can the church say amen? So he's coming with judgment, and we're going to see what is going to happen. It's like we read in the 11th verse, this beast that was slain. This is 
the Antichrist is going to be slain and thrown in the lake of fire a thousand years before anybody else goes in. And you're going to see that at the end of this chapter. Let's go now up to verses numbers um, 11. Are we there? I don't mean to be confusing. Chapter number 19, verses 11. Are we there? Now, what you're seeing here is what we call the apocalypse, what people call the apocalypse or the finality and or the battle of Armageddon. You're seeing the end. This is when Jesus comes and cuts the image down, cuts that ten-toe kingdom down, the image falls. This is what you're going to read right here. Read. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon it was called faithful and true, in righteousness he does make war. So he, now what is he coming to do? He's coming to make war. Now Isaiah and prophecy saw him, 60, uh, the 63rd chapter of the book of Isaiah, the, Isaiah saw him coming from Bozra with dyed garments. He had trodden the winepress of the wrath of God. This is when he's going to do it. He's going to come and destroy all of these things. And while people are walking around thinking stuff is funny, and I keep having to say that. See, in our day, people think sin is a joke. Sin is no joke. Because anybody that does not uh, allow God to reconcile them in the, in the church dispensation will not, as I talked about last week, will not be able to keep up with the horsemen. Can the church say amen? If you can't, if you can't run in the land of peace, if, if, we're, if the land of peace were you, there is no way that a person can run with the footmen. When the swelling of Jordan comes, which is symbolic language to deal with how the Antichrist is going to come in like a flood, and the spirit of Al-Qaeda, which is over there right now, which is the spirit of Antichrist, which you saw in that image, those Middle Eastern nations where they're cutting people's heads off, that's the devil. That's how we understand what these represent, based upon what we see today. Do you understand what I'm saying? So let's see here what's going to happen. He's coming to what? Make war. Write down Isaiah 63, verses 1 through 5. You're going to see that in, an, in another language. Read in, an, in other terms, as it were. Read, and what, look at what happens. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. Mm -hmm. And on his head were many crowns. Because why? Because Jesus is what? The king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the king of all kings. So now he's coming and saying, I'm the real king. They, people don't want to worship the true king, but they'll worship all this other stuff. But they don't want to worship the king of kings. And all of those that, that took the mark of the beast during this time, you're going to see what happened to them in the 17th chapter if we get there tonight. Read here. Mm-hmm. And, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Nobody knows that name. Read. And he was clothed with a vesture, what? Dipped in blood. Read. And his name was called the word of God. Isaiah saw that vesture, read. And the armies which were in heaven followed him. Now, did not Daniel talk about the throne coming with fire? That's the church coming with him to issue judgment. Can the church say amen? We just read that in the book of Daniel in the seventh chapter. This is what's going to happen. Can the church say amen? And I know I'm giving you a lot of information and it's a lot to digest, but stay with me. This train is going somewhere. Can the church say amen? You know where it's going? It's going to glory. <laughs> now, really for us, saints, this is simply helping us understand what is going to happen. Don't worry about understanding all of this now. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to get it all. This makes sure that we live up to the standard of holiness. So that we can come with him Amen. when he comes and his garments are dipped in blood. It's dipped in blood because he's coming to make war. This is all symbolic language. Don't think Jesus is coming and he's dipping his garments in blood. That's not, that's not what he's saying here. This is symbolic language that depicts the events that will happen. Can the church say amen? Mm -hmm. With the armies which were in heaven, followed him. 
Upon what? White horses. White is symbolic of purity. Horses is symbolic of what? Power. So he, we're coming with him in white and, and in power. Righteousness and in power. Can the church say amen? Why? Because we have taken off our righteousness, which is that filthy rags, and we are now clothed in his righteousness alone. Do you remember the parable where he talked about the man that did not have a garment for the wedding? He was cast out. See, Israel, if they would have listened to God, they would have had their garments right. But he went into the highways, according to the parable, and the byways, and called who in? You and I. Can the church say amen? And now we are being clothed with his righteousness alone. Can the church say amen? All right. Where would I stop at? All right. Uh, let's see. You're following him with white clove, what? In, uh, in fine linen, white and clean. Mm-hmm. Read and let's see what happens. And out of his mouth shall be uh, uh, what a sharp sword in another place. His word is as a two-edged sword. This is what he's going to do. The Bible said he's going to speak the word and he, he's going to cause them to be in derision. And the flesh shall consume away from their bones and their tongues in their mouths and their eyes in their sockets. Let's keep reading here. Mm-hmm. And with it he shall what? Smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Now, Sister uh, Young, you asked me a long time ago, who will be the ruling element in the end times? It will be Israel. He will take Israel that these nations right now are whooping them. Then he's going to take them after the millennial reign of Christ and, or during the, uh, during the millennial reign of Christ and he's going to make them the ruling element. But they're going to rule in righteousness. All those that are left that did not take the mark of the beast. He's going to take Israel now and make them the ruling element and they will take the law of God throughout the world. Can the church say amen? Now I don't have time to give you that scripture. There's a scripture in the Old Testament that makes that point. The rod of iron. Can the church say amen? Read here. Them with the rod of iron. Read. And he treaded the rind press of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And let's go to Isaiah to make that point. Let's see where he treads. This is Daniel, Isaiah's sin. The Lord in prophecy coming to issue judgment. 63. Now I'm going to make a point to you. To show you, saints, that God had to open up the understanding of the prophet, you're going to see when... It, in this particular prophecy, when he sees the Lord, he does not recognize him. But in the sixth chapter, he did recognize him. But in this chapter, he doesn't. Now, I want you to read this here. Who is this that cometh from, from Edom with dyed garments from Bozdrum that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I, what, what do you say? I uh, speak in righteousness, um, that speak in right, I that speak in righteousness, might, mighty to save. Now, this is him coming what? To destroy men's government. Read here. Wherefore thou art, where, now he's asking a question here. Wherefore art thou red in apparel, and thy garments like, uh, like him? That uh, what? Treadeth in the wine vat. Now why is it red? Because it's dipped in blood. Read here. I, what is it? I have, now this is the Lord responding to Isaiah. Read. I have trodden the wine press alone. Read. And all the people that, were, uh, that was none with me. Read. I will trodden them in my anger. And uh, what trample them in my fury, and their blood shall uh, be sprinkled upon my garment, read, and I will stain, uh, what? He says, and I will stain all my remnant, read, for the day. Now the day of vengeance, according to the scripture, I don't have time to show you this, but the day of vengeance in the scripture is the seven year tribulation period. It is the day of vengeance according to the scripture. The end of the day of vengeance will culminate with this event happening. 
This is prophecy concerning Jesus coming and treading the wine press of God. And what is going to stain his garments? The blood of captains, the blood of mighty men, the blood of noble men. They're going to come and trodden the wine press of the wrath of God. This is what he's going to do. Let's keep reading here. On oh, the day, the day of vengeance is in my heart, mm-hmm. and the uh, with the year of my redeemer has come. Verse number five. I looked, and there was none to help. I wondered. Read, and there was none. Uh, there was uh, none to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation unto unto me, and my fury. Mm-hmm. Is upholding it. So this is what he's going to do. Verses number six, read. And I tread down the people in my anger. Now those people are all the people that will come to fight against Jerusalem, saints. All those that took the mark of the beast. He's going to stump them out with his word. And you know who's coming with him? The armies of heaven. Can the church say amen? We're coming with him to issue, somebody say judgment, and break down this image um, of Nebuchadnezzar or the kingdoms of man and the beasts as it were that he also saw in the seventh chapter now let's go back to the book of Revelation I got about seven eight minutes can the church say amen and we go open up for questions all right verses numbers um 16 and he have he hath in his vesture and on his thigh a name written what king of kings lord of lords and I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cries with a loud voice, saying to all the fowl mm-hmm, that fly in the midst of heaven. Mm-hmm. He says, uh, come and gather yourself together to the supper of God. Now, let's look at the supper of God in other words. Let's go now to, let's see here, Zechariah chapter number 14. The supper of God is, is going to be over there in the valley of Megiddo. Like I keep making the point that the Middle East is where all of the events of the culmination of the end time would take place. This is another prophecy. Zechariah chapter number, uh, let's see here, 14 verse 20. Let me see, is that it? 14 verse 12. Can the church say amen? It's in there. It's in there. Can the church say amen? Now, when he said, he calls the fowls of the air. Now, what is he calling them to? The great supper of what the Lord, because he has just fought the battle of Armageddon. Now, these events have not happened. This is what shall happen hereafter. This is going to happen to close out the um, tribulation period. Verse number 12. This is a prophecy. And it shall come to pass. uh, Verse number 12, 14th chapter. Are we there? And in this shall be the plague, excuse me. Wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that had fought against Jerusalem. So the scripture said, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, right? There is, there's not going to be peace in Jerusalem until this takes place. And what you're seeing right now is the culmination of end time events happening. But what is going on with the EU? But when this takes place, saints, the peace of Israel will come. Can the church say amen? And the reason why saints they're in such disarray right now is simply because they refuse to walk with God. So I don't care how much aid America gives them. I don't care what people do. They will not be able to deliver them out of the hands of God until the Lord does it. Can the church say amen? Read here. It's my Jerusalem. Now this is what's going to happen. And their flesh shall consume away while they stand on feet, here will be all the armies of the earth are going to converge on Israel. They're going to come from the north. God's going to put a hook in their jaw. He's going to bring them back down. The kings of the north, kings of the south, the beasts are all going to come down there and converge on Israel. To what? Try to take a spoil or destroy the children of Israel. And what is going to happen? Here will come God in Christ 
in his in glory coming as he trodden the winepress of God, the church coming with him, and this is what's going to happen, and their flesh shall consume away while they stand on their feet. So envision it like this. As they're standing there with bazookas and, and, and all their armament and all these things, God is going to speak the word, and they're going to drop dead. And I don't have time to tell you, take you there tonight, but the Bible makes it very clear. Over there in the Valley of Megiddo, it is also called in the scriptures, the Valley of Jehoshaphat. That God, that valley will be a quarter of a mile wide. Praise the Lord. And I think a quarter of a mile wide and 120 miles long, if memory serves me correct. And the Bible said in the book of Ezekiel that blood will run bridle deep to a horse. You know how far a horse, a full-grown horse neck comes to? Approximately six feet. Six foot deep, a river of blood. And what is God going to do? He's going to call the fowls of heaven down. And they're going to eat the flesh of kings, captains, mighty men, men of renown. All of this is going to happen. So the images that you see in Daniel, saints, depict what is going to happen in the end time. So when we dealt with the image of Daniel and the four beasts, the kingdom that affected them in Daniel's day was Babylon, the, the head of iron. I mean, the head of gold, gold excuse me. But the kingdom that affect, would affect him, affect Israel in this time, based upon the, uh, the symbolic language that we see will be America. Then the, other, then the other images will fall in their place. All of this is to show us what is going to happen. Now, what does this mean to us? What this means to us is simply we need to make sure that we are in the place where God wants us to be so that we can come with him. Because he's coming to do this. And the armies of heaven are coming with him. Can the church say amen? And I want to make sure when I come, praise the Lord, I'm issuing judgment. Can the church say amen? And not taking judgment. Can the church say amen? And, and I didn't give you this scripture. But what is going to happen is the Bible said he's going to deliver them in the uh, sixth seal. In another place, he talks about the sixth part of the world, as it were, will be left. One-sixth of the world's population will be left. How many, million, how many people are on earth today? I think they said seven billion. It used to be about six billion. So let's, just good, let's just use rough numbers. If there's six, billions on, six billion people on the earth, one billion people will be left. Can the church say amen? Now, I don't have time to give you all this tonight, but I think I'm going to conclude this. And uh, one day we'll have to deal with, the, with it in, in, in its entirety. I know I gave you a lot of information, but it is simply to help us to understand that we need to be ready. Because when he comes, he's coming back for a church that has made herself ready. And the way you know that the church is coming is because we are the virgin. Can the church say amen? And then there'll be those that will be called, no doubt, to the marriage Ceremony. Anybody have any questions tonight? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma